Hi, I'm Mary Yarbrough. I'm on the teaching team for the Dallas Bible Church Women's Ministry Team. And I welcome you here today for this message. One of the things that I realized about my um, fourth generation Texas self this week was that I have some serious entitlement issues. Uh, one more historical event descended on our state in, a, in the form of a deep freeze. It affected 254 counties in Texas, every single one of them. We had intermittent power for about 72 hours. And at one point, uh, our, the temperature inside our house registered at 45 degrees. Now, if you're a native Texan like me, you know that we have certain expectations about our state and we have grown accustomed to, to certain unalienable rights. In fact, uh, for years, we prided ourselves in the fact that our power grid was so strong that we could actually secede from the nation and become our own country. Well, all of that is a lot of smack talk, considering what happened this week. It seems as though our power grid had never been tested in the way that it was this week. Now, I'm not gonna get into the political aspect of all of this. There's a lot of mudslinging going on right now, and it's gonna take a little while to sort it all out. But the bottom line is this, is that our power source failed us this week. As I lay huddled under the covers in the middle of the night this last week, it seemed that God whispered to me that until our own power source fizzles out, we will never know the one true, one true source that never will. His power can and has weathered every storm and disaster, and it's time for a transfer of power. I can't wait to step into that with you in just a few minutes in the bulk of the message. But right now, let me pray for you. Father, I just want to thank you for whomever's listening to this message. You know that you have given me every word, and I just offer it back to you as an offering to speak to the hearts of those who are hearing. Holy Spirit, interpret the words that I have and the words that need to be heard. And I thank you that you are faithful in delivering your message. I thank you for these women, especially of Dallas Bible Church. Love on them in the way that you only can. And I thank you. It's in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Spirit that I pray these things. Amen. Before we jump into the um, text for this week, I want to um, briefly revisit the first two Beatitudes. Mainly, it's to refresh our minds because of the impact that those two will have on the portion of Scripture that we're going to look at today. For a number of years, as I've read the Beatitudes, I thought of the troubled people that God cared for, the poor, the meek, the weak, the humble. All of those are true. But when the Holy Spirit said, today is the day, I'm going to show you that this is you. I was undone. Oswald Chambers calls the Beatitudes dynamite when the Holy Spirit reveals them one by one to the heart of the children of God. They explode in ways that, that, that change everything. The knowledge and real, the realization that this is me. Kat shared in her message a couple of weeks ago that it was the repentant heart that Jesus was calling for. Well, I am persuaded to think that these first two Beatitudes are like the bedrock for the rest of the, the sermon. When we sit in the presence of the Father and allow the Spirit to make these truths personal, there is a powerful repentant work that takes place in our hearts it, it, it takes root to color everything we see after that in life-changing ways. Blessed are the poor in spirit, complete and utter spiritual poverty, 
sitting in his presence, he awakened me to the fact that I am spiritually bankrupt without Jesus, completely impoverished in my soul. I have no purpose outside of Jesus. I have no giftedness outside of Jesus. And most of all, I have no hope outside of Jesus. I am poor in spirit when I come to that devastatingly wonderful realization. My husband and I were close to bankruptcy a number of years ago. After saving and, and building a business and a career, um, socking away money for our kids' college fund, the music stopped. We tried to salvage what we thought was salvageable. In doing so, we drained it all. Not only did we have, we didn't have any money in the bank, we, we had a mound of debt that we couldn't pay. Even though we didn't see this at the time, God was faithful to give us an earthly visual of a heavenly fact. When the Spirit broke through me that day, he showed me that that mound of debt was my sin. Not universal sin, not Adam and Eve's sin, not the Pharisee's sin, not Judas's sin, but my sin. And so I grieved. I mourned the fact that it was my sin that required him to go to the cross. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And in that completely impoverished state, Jesus said, you belong to me now. You are a child of a new kingdom. You're a royal heir to the throne of the king of kings, and you don't need to bring anything. I paid the way for you. And in grieving the impact of my sin, Jesus comforted me with a hope that's so far beyond anything I could conceive. And he paid for my sin, past sin, present sin, future sin. And he paid yours too. Once we acknowledge this mind-blowing realization that we now belong to the kingdom and somehow recover from the fact that we were nothing before entering into these, these hallowed courts, we often wrestle to, to grasp the fact that we're clothed in the royal robes of our Savior. We are wrapped in his holiness and we are welcomed into the presence of the Father who has loved us since before the creation of the world. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7, Paul says this, God rich, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even though we were dead in transgressions, made us alive in Christ. By grace, you are saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus to de demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus, get this, for good works that God prepared beforehand so we may do them. And because of who and whose we are, we have this vital role to play in this beloved kingdom that we have been placed in. We are not princesses that we read, read about in fairy tales that are entitled and privileged, just sitting pretty. That seat that we have been given next to Jesus is not just a place of honor. That seat has an assignment that is unique for each one of us. It's ripe with purpose that to reflect and demonstrate the lavish grace, love, mercy, and kindness that has been shown to each one of us. And did you get that part in verse 10? It says, before we ever took a seat at that kingdom table, our job had already been laid out for us. So let's take a look at those assignments. Turn to Matthew 5, 13. 
you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Salt in a shaker does absolutely nothing to add the flavor to anything. It must be shaken out and distributed in order to have any value at all. One of my favorite salts is Himalayan salt. It's pretty, it's pink. Um, and I'm at, when I'm adding it to something, I think I'm make it doing, doing something special. But it's in rock form because it's been mined from mountains instead of being manufactured in a lab. This salt has to be ground in order to be distributed. So we, as the salt of the earth, have to decide how salty are we going to be. We can be like the pretty pink salt in the shaker. Metaphorically, uh, we keep our masks in place. Wow, that's taken on a whole new meaning, hasn't it? We put up a great facade for others and we keep our faith neatly bottled up. We have our daily quiet time every morning and then we go about our day with our own agenda, our own, own plans, and our own pleasure-seeking activities. Or we can be ground like the salt that is mined from the mountain. What if we dared to daily step into the presence of the king, basking in his presence, breathing in his glory and his grace and his mercy and his kindness, waiting for his voice to speak truth into us? What if we willingly emptied ourselves into his hands? What if we see that all that we are, our giftedness, the, the struggles of our past, the pain of our losses, the sin that we've been forgiven? What if we see all of these things as beautiful offerings when willingly placed in God's hands? We give him permission to mine all of these things for his good purposes to spread over a world that needs exactly what we've been through, a world that has been subjected to death and decay. As Kristen mentioned in her introduction, we're in the days of the already, but the not yet. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount declares that the kingdom has come upon his arrival. It's the inaugural kingdom, but there's coming a day where the kingdom of God will be fully consummated until Jesus returns and takes uh, and that takes place, we as his kingdom children possess a lasting hope to a deteriorating and decaying world. Let's take a look at our next assignment. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, in order to get the profound impact of the light, I'd like to look at three aspects of the light. First, the origin of the light. Secondly, the identity of the light. And then third, the light in us. To understand the origin of light, we need to go to the, back to the beginning. Turn to Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without shape and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the watery deep. But the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, so God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and darkness night. There was evening and there was morning, marking the first day. 
Now we know that the God of creation contained all of the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Now where did this light come from in day one? You may think it's the sun, moon, and stars, but let's rethink that. In verse 14, it says, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. That's the sun, moon, and stars. And that was day four. So the light that was singular, that was in day one, appears to be different from the lights, plural, in day four. It's not clear who this light is in, that was created in day one. However, all of creation is a manifestation of God, the, of the God of creation. And one of the first acts was to separate the light from the darkness. The Net Bible's notes say this, the Hebrew word simply means light, but it is used often in scripture to convey the ideas of salvation, get this, salvation, joy, knowledge, righteousness, and life. In this context, one cannot ignore those connotations. It is the antithesis of the darkness. The first thing God does is correct the darkness. Without the light, there's only chaos. Salvation, joy, knowledge, righteousness, and life. Now let's turn to John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus was the Word. He is the Word. Jesus was with God. Jesus is with God. Jesus was God and Jesus is God. Jesus was God the Son in the triune Godhead at creation now, I have no authority to proclaim that this light that appeared on day one is exclusively or singularly Jesus. The God of creation was not created. He always was and is and will be. However, is it not possible that that light on day one was a reflection or a manifestation of all three? Charles Spurgeon says this, how there was light before there was any sun, for the sun was not created until the fourth day is not for us to say. But God is not dependent on his own creation. He can make light without a sun. The point I'm making is this, when Jesus tells his followers in Matthew 5, 14, that you are the light of the world, there is creation power in that light that is in every one of us who follow him. This is that transfer of power that I was talking about in uh, the introduction. We have a new power source that is everlasting. We don't have weak little flashlights with batteries that we can turn on and off that I've used plenty this week. When Jesus Christ stepped in every one of our messes and saved us, he placed in us his light. That's who we are. Uh, he, he, he dispelled the darkness that we were wandering around in and, and, and lit us up with a whole new identity as children of the kingdom of God. You are the light of the world with a power source that will never die. Circle back to Ephesians 2.10 2, again. And pay attention to some, to some phrases here. We are his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so we may do them. 
Now compare that to Matthew 5, 16. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. Did you get that? Our good works were assigned to us beforehand. If in fact our good works and our good deeds uh, are unique assignments for each one of us, then we can conclude that our individual stories matter. I am convinced that one of the most powerful ways that we as children of God can let our, shine, our light shine in a world that is slipping deeper and deeper into darkness is to allow the Father access to those dark and broken places he either allowed or ordained for his glory, glory and ultimately our good. Our good deeds should not be an endeavor uh, we set out to accomplish, nor an outward manifestation of all the lofty ways that we want to serve. Instead, as we completely and utterly yield to the ways of our Father, He accomplishes the very thing that we cannot manufacture ourselves, a beautiful, authentic reflection of Jesus Himself. Just as I suggested in being the salt of the earth and emptying ourselves and offering all to the Father to use as he wills, we brighten our light by being fully open and surrendered to him. Sometimes I think we stymie the process of full redemption by hiding certain things away because it just hurts too bad to bring them into the light. And so we hide them. You may say, well, you don't, you don't understand. It was just too painful. That day that I, I thought I would die of the grief that was overwhelming me. I can't pull that out. Or, or what about that day I got the diagnosis and then the days that followed were just, just got worse and worse. I thought I was going to die. That day, you have probably had a day like one of those. What I think many of us miss in the midst of our pain, because we're so focused on the pain, is that the way that Jesus was and is with us through it all. I'm thinking of specifically dear friends that have been through these kinds of, of pain. And I wanted to say now that they, they, they are like a living testimony and a witness to their master healer. They may recall or even acknowledge the pain that they have gone through, but there's always the word, and yet. And yet is a word that kingdom kids use. Jesus was there. He held them. He sustained them. He reminded them that this was not their home. He caught every single one of their tears. He strengthened them to step into another day and he gave them hope for tomorrow. These beautiful warriors of the kingdom, they keep their hearts open and on the altar, giving the Father full access to that pain. And oh, how bright is their light. What a hurting world cannot fathom and is in desperate need of is that kind of hope. They grope around in the dark, trying to uh, make sense of what they're going through. You're telling me there's purpose for everything you went through? You're telling me that you were comforted by someone you can't even see? <laughs> well, that's a resounding yes, and here's why. It's because Jesus has been there. Jesus has been to the worst case scenario. The one seated next to us in that heavenly realms, he identifies with our pain. A devotional that I just love, it's called, I Hear His Whisper, says this, those who saw me in my sufferings were convinced that I was defeated. They mocked and spit on me, the son of God. Yet they didn't know that my victory was not found on the earth but in my tender relationship with my father. No matter what they did to me, nothing could keep me from my father's love. 
And so, my child, you too are free, unbound, unbroken by the darkness of this world. You are not defeated. You will overcome. My victory in your life will prevail. Faith in me is the victory that overcomes the world. And no one, no one can extinguish the flame that I have kindled in your heart. It takes tremendous courage to step over the thresh threshold of vulnerability, uh, exposing ourselves to the world, but not so much so if we first lay ourselves bare before the Father, Jesus holding our hand and reassuring us that he's there, he's not going anywhere, he's gonna remain right there with us, and then the Holy Spirit comes in and gently shines this beautiful light on each one of our hidden places, illuminating them not from the former unrelenting pain that we remembered, but through the lens of our Savior. Our pain now is wrapped in the grace and his mercy. With great care, he heals and then opens our eyes to see that perhaps this whole process is bigger than we are and that we're being entrusted with a, the sacred works of his kingdom. It takes courage. It takes more than courage. It takes trust in the one who allowed it all in the first place. So we take up his mantle with open hearts and hands and to eagerly accept and partake of the job he has for us to do. And then he brings someone along who needs to hear the hope that we have. God's light is like laser-like in knowing exactly who to send our way. We sit with them as Jesus sat with us. We hold them as Jesus held us. We dry their tears as Jesus did with us. And we encourage them with words of hope, showing him, them the way and then inviting them into the kingdom that we belong to. And right then and there, we begin to not only understand the purpose of our struggles, but our very purpose in being on this earth. Seated next to Jesus, we've got the best seat in the house. Our assignments are to reflect and to demonstrate the grace and mercy we have been shown, we are made to be the salt of the earth and we are made to be the light of the world.